minute. Before I start that, I just want to say, I mean, I haven't had anything to do with organising this conference. Jose Luis, together with Adelina, with Raphael, with Cristiano, with Joanna and Angie, uh, those are the ones I think have been mostly involved in this. Um, a huge amount of work. Um, I'm sure we'll have plenty of opportunities to thank them again uh, throughout the conference, particularly uh, in the later sessions. So thank you very much for the introduction. So, I'll get my slides up. So, I want to talk then about dementia care. Um, I'm going to uh, put this up just very quickly. Standard disclaimer, um, and just to say, I have no conflicts of interest which are relevant to this presentation. So, um, in the full detail, you can read on the web. Now, what I want to uh, cover is some new challenges in the dementia field, uh, some responses that we're seeing, particularly in terms of evidence from new studies, uh, new scenarios, perhaps, um, and new directions. Now, um, what I'm going to do when I'm picking up on particularly, well, many of these areas, I'm going to focus particularly on either England or the UK, because I'm, a, because I'm more familiar with that, B, because of lots of interesting things going on currently, which you might be interested to hear about, but I'll try to make sure I can generalise to other contexts as well. Okay? Now, there are two important um, anniversaries I want to mention. First one is that PSSRU is 40 this year. And so when I was trying to think about how dementia has changed, I thought I would just see what had happened since 1974. So just three things. Number of people with dementia in the UK, more than doubled over the course of that period. Percentage of care home residents in the UK who are, well, in 1970, were called severely confused. From 2014, severe dementia, a bit of an increase. And this one amazes me. The paper's in Medline with the keyword Alzheimer's. <laughs> 42 <laughs> to 76,000. Okay, now, that gives you an indication of lots of things. Um, big increase in prevalence, come back to that. Changes to some extent in the balance of care and the representation in care, and certainly a huge increase in scientific research interest. Medline is, of course, only medical papers that you put in social care. It doesn't get picked up by Medline and even more. So there's a lot of the big growth in this area. Let me just show you the contribution that people with dementia make. This is from the Global Burden of Disease Study. I'm sure you've all heard about this, Chris Murray's big enterprise. Uh, they produced a new set of estimates for 2010. These are the figures for the UK, and each column shows you for a five-year uh, five five age band the contribution of different types of health problem to disability, as they define it. This big red bit in the middle is mental health, uh, and the neurological conditions are this area here, and this impact is the dementia area, primarily dementia, at least in other neurological conditions like Parkinson's in there. Okay, but you can see in this age group, it's 80 plus, that's as far as they distinguish in terms of age bands, a considerable contribution to total disability burden, shall we say, call it that. Now, there's, I mentioned there were two anniversaries um, this year. The second anniversary hasn't quite happened. Um, that is my daughter, some of you know my daughter. Uh, my daughter is about to give birth um, to a girl uh, in the next, I've got my iPhone in case it's in the next 40 minutes, okay, <laughs> but very soon. Um, I just thought I'd work out what the chances are for her. And we know that two out of five girls born today in the UK will live to the age of 100. That's the projection. If you live to age 100, you've got a 72% greater than 72% chance of having dementia. So my imminent granddaughter has, I reckon, about a 30% chance of being alive 100 years from now with dementia. Okay, crude figures, and that's assuming lots of things, the prevalence rates stay the same. But I think it emphasises dementia is not rare. Okay, and now, I think probably all of us, almost all of us, will have a relative or know somebody quite close who has dementia. So it's, it's not a rare condition in the way perhaps it was to some extent in the past. There is no cure, there is no simple care solution, although some promising some things coming through. Um, responsibilities for dementia straddle different sectors, health, social care, housing, social welfare, others, employment, labour markets and so on. 
Uh, unpaid carers are the absolute bedrock of dementia care. We know that, and we'll come back to most of these things in a minute. Outcomes are quite hard to define in some cases, certainly hard to measure if you want to use individual people with dementia's own self-report, and costs a huge amount. Okay, so some familiar characteristics, I'm sure, for all of us, except you didn't come up my granddaughter. Okay. Um, now, what's the projection for the future? These are from the Alzheimer's Disease International website. This is their recent projection of the number of people with dementia over a period of 40 years. You can see the high-income countries, that the UK, in the bottom here, but the growth will be much faster in low- and middle-income countries of the world. So the challenge is A, global, but B, disproportionately um, challenging uh, in low- and middle-income country contexts. Okay? Now, unfortunately, these are terms, three terms, well, I don't like most of them, uh, certainly don't like global epidemic or demographic <coughs> time bomb, uh, but those are the terms you'll see in the media, okay, patients and politicians. Um, emergency in slow motion feels like the right sort of description to me. There is some evidence, some of you know about the CFAS study, which is a big uh, cohort study, an epidemiological study um, uh, in England, led by Carol Brain. Most recent evidence, a paper from Fiona Matthews and others in last year's Lancet, which suggests that the rate of dementia in age bands may be slowing, and other studies have found the same thing. But we're still talking about this, their figures do not feature in this chart from PDI, but clearly we're going to see a huge increase over the next 30, 40, 50 years. And there'll be big consequences for expenditure. I won't uh, go into the details of that, but there have been a number of projections. What I will do is just mention here um, that uh, many of us, I put down loads of people here, and Bayo, who's here, is government registration. I can't see where she's gone now. I bet she is. Uh, it's probably going to join the team, or it's beginning to join the team. I apologise, I think there's a name on there. But lots of people uh, in this project, which started uh, two or three months ago, <coughs> will be looking at projections of numbers of people with dementia over years up to 2040, looking at the costs and outcomes or co consequences for quality of life and health over that period, and then looking to simulate what would happen if we delivered better health and care for those people and for their carers. Okay, so what I'm going to the figures show you in a moment from some studies, uh, and those estimates I showed you just now for projections for the future are relatively crude. We will hope to do something much more sophisticated and certainly have a, a very skilled um, set of people in the project. So that's got another three and a half years to run yet, so we haven't got quite got any results to show you from that project. Okay, so let me then go on to new responses. What have been the responses in this area? in terms of new evidence. And I want to just say something, generally quite briefly, under these heads, and share with you some evidence, not, not some of it's from PSSRU, much of it isn't from PSSRU, but some new evidence which I think is quite helpful, pointing us in the direction of better care, better treatment, better responses, and to some extent better prevention um, of dementia. Um, and what I want to do, although I'll focus uh, there's two big um, pieces of work we've done recently. One is a report on improvements in dementia care and support in England since 2009. That's not quite in the public domain, but will be uh, in a few weeks. Um, it's finished, but just going to review. And then there's a review paper that Valentina Ieni and Renee Romeo and I did uh, on the economics of uh, dementia care. And then there are a number of trials and other scientific references that go through. So those are the sources. All these slides will be available one day afterwards, so you can get more details later. Okay, <coughs> on prevention. What do we know about dementia prevention? This paper, very nice, very timely paper that came out um, from the group down here. Sam Norton works with Carol Brain and Fiona Matthews and others uh, at Cambridge. And what they did was use the CFAS and other data to look at what is called population attributable risk of Alzheimer's disease. And these seven, there should be seven, yeah, these seven are the areas where, these are the, the things that we know are risk factors for dementia. Okay, I was disappointed not to find red wine on there, but I'm sure <laughs> it's okay. uh, in a positive way, of course. Um, but we know that 
having these things is not good for you. Okay? Uh, and what they analyze, these people analyze, if you combine the risks associated with these, take account of the interdependence between them, of course, they reckon it's about 28%, or around a third of Alzheimer's disease, it's that part of dementia, by the way, Alzheimer's disease cases worldwide might be attributed to potentially modifiable risk factors. We still want to do the modification. I was in a meeting recently with people in Public Health England. We're talking about dementia prevention and what could be done. And there are certainly things like hypertension, obesity, uh, physical inactivity, which would be good if people did more, more well, less of each of those, put it that way, that would be good for their dementia. But interestingly, public health doctors and others have been telling the population for what, 25 years? to do more physical activity, not to get obese, to be careful, be careful for their blood pressure, with pretty much zero impact. Okay? So the chances of getting people then to do these things or to avoid these things in order to avoid dementia don't look that great, given the way we've approached things so far. So there is a challenge, I think, in getting people to think uh, along these lines. Okay, so on prevention, nevertheless, I think the evidence is getting there that we have something that we can do. Uh, and one quick study, just to mention, came out, I think it's still only published <coughs> online actually, uh, in the International Journal of Geriatric Psychiatry, David Lowry, working in the EVIDEM project, led by Steve Eilin. And this was a randomised trial, very short study, looking at uh, a tailored exercise regime, tailored to the condition of circumstances and needs and abilities of the individual, for the person with dementia and the carers. And what they found was no improvements in the symptoms of person with dementia, but a reduction in care of burden. Now whether that's because the care was walking faster away from the person with dementia, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> think of all sorts of anecdotes to go with that. But um, it looks, looks quite promising. Um, colleagues here, Anne Rappel, um, have done the cost effectiveness analysis, and it looks cost effective. So this looks like an intervention supporting what Sam Norton and others have in their Lancet paper, Lancet Neurology paper, suggesting um, encouraging evidence. Okay, so that's the prevention side. What about screening? Now there's lots of controversy about screening um, and there's been quite a debate online and elsewhere about this. Some people, first two bullets are some of the uh, arguments against screening or population-wide screening for dementia. One argument is it raises unrealistic expectations about what can be done. Secondly, it's argued that it diverts attention and resources away from those who are already diagnosed. We know that memory clinics in this country have long waiting lists. They don't, they're not able to deal with the bombardment of cases that they have at the moment. So that's two of the reasons why people think screening population-wide is perhaps not a very good idea. On the other hand, people have argued, actually, don't we have a right to know we've got dementia? And perhaps we can plan for it. And in fact, aren't there now some promising new interventions coming along? So there's arguments both ways. I'm not going to enter into the argument, but I am going to show you this finding from a piece of work led by Josie Dixon here at LSE, um, which has looked at a modelling study. What would happen if we had a one-off screen for dementia at age 75? Two findings to report. One is that about, about 3,514, to be precise, mm -hmm. people uh, would be diagnosed with schizophrenia and with dementia. Um, but two thirds of them, roughly, would never have received a diagnosis. Given in the moment in England, we diagnose over, just under 50% of people with dementia. We miss 50%. So the screen would actually identify many people who would otherwise be missed. And the screening, if it's followed by good post-diagnostic support, the sort of things available today, looks cost-effective. Okay, so there's an issue about screening, <coughs> not to say we should go with it, there's lots and lots of challenges, but nevertheless, it's one of those things which could improve the care and support experience of people with dementia and their carers. Let's go on to then carers. This is a quote we have um, policy framework uh, which is structured by this thing, the Prime Minister's challenge on dementia. And whatever one's political position, I think it'd be hard not to admire David Cameron for giving dementia such a very high profile. 
uh, and there have been a number of dementia events uh, where he has participated personally and has got very engaged in the area. So I think that, that has helped us a lot in England to take forward discussions in the dementia area. So there's a quote there about the importance of carers. We know they're the unsung heroes of dementia care and there are high costs. And I'm going to show you just, this is a piece of work that Lena and Raphael and Bayo and Bo and various others of us here have been doing for the Alzheimer's Society. Uh, a new cost calculation for dementia. The report will come out in about uh, five. This is just one slide. And those costs will grow as prevalence grows. Probably they'll grow not just in absolute terms but in relative terms given the pressures on health and social care budgets. We know that many carers experience a lot of stress, so what works? Let me show you results from one study which is looking at how to support family carers, people with dementia, which is getting some very uh, encouraging findings. So this is the START study led by Jill Livingstone, who's a professor of psychogeriatrics at University College London, um, and we're involved in the economic evaluation here. Now, the START intervention is a program, eight sessions for each family carer, over about eight to 14 weeks. It's delivered by psychology graduates, not clinical psychologists, but relatively cheap psychology graduates. Um, they give them a manual, and the carers get a, a DVD with relaxation music and other things if they want. They're given techniques to help them in these different areas, understand the behaviour the person they care for, manage behaviour, and so on. You can read down there, including relaxation techniques and planning for the future. And the intervention is being evaluated, so it's a randomised controlled trial, comparing this intervention with usual support, the care and support, the person with dementia and the carer, um, evaluation in London. Now, the results so far, that are published are for eight months, and let me show you what they are. So there's two papers in the BMJ. This is the clinical effectiveness paper led by Jill. And what you've got here, two results. Carers who got usual support, eight months after the intervention finished, carers who got usual support were four times more likely to have clinically significant depression than carers who got the start intervention. Okay, so a huge difference in that clinically significant relevant level of depression. Um, and there was a small quality gain, quality of adjusted life year, quality gain is used for the evaluation. There's also suggestions of lower levels of elder abuse in the staff group, the very huge significance, uh, and very other outcomes which were evaluated but don't show any differences between the groups. So that's the cost, that's the effectiveness result. At 24 months, now this is a paper which is with the Lancet, it's come back, we're just responding to reviewers now. Reviewers' comments, they, always, they don't look too bad, but who knows whether we're going to get through. But if it does get published, this will show actually the same effects at 24 months. Now it's often said that the person with dementia from the point of diagnosis has maybe four and a half to five years of life expectancy. If that is the case, then what this is showing is that almost half of that life expectancy from the point of diagnosis, you can support carers in ways which are significantly beneficial to them. So this is quite an important, reasonably long-term in a context gain. Okay, so some gains uh, in quality of life as well for people with dementia. The eight-month study, we didn't look at people with dementia, we did in the 24-month study. So that's the effectiveness. Cost-effectiveness shows that actually were slightly higher costs in the staff group, but not slightly different, and certainly very cost effective. Um, if you don't know what an ISA is, this will be weird language, but incremental cost effectiveness ratio is the cost effectiveness summary measure. Um, and this figure down here, £6,000 per quality, any health economist will tell you that's good value for money. Okay, so it's quite a cost effective intervention. At 24 months, the same results. It continues to be cost effective. Okay, and now that's looking at both carer outcomes 
and personal dementia by patients, in this case, outcomes. Okay, now, another area, staff skills, training, and turnover. This is just four bullet points on people who work with dementia, pe people who work with people with dementia um, in England. Less than 1% of workers at establishments that provide services to people with dementia have a formal dementia qualification, less than 1%. About a third have received dementia training, uh, work that where Jill's gone, I can't think she is, that Jill and uh, colleagues have done looking at uh, comparing people with, who support people with dementia with other workers found that the dementia workforce was much more likely, to, more likely to be female, part-time to working in agencies, in the short-term uh, placements often, and to be less qualified. So the dementia workforce really isn't up to the, the task, I would say, and we know that staff turnover is very high, about a third annually. So we have a problem if we're trying to improve care in day centres, residential care settings, people's own homes, and elsewhere. Now, one method of maybe trying to improve staff skills, Martin Oral, and you read that, uh, is another professor at UCL, uh, has done lots of work with colleagues like Bob Woods and Amy Spector and various others on cognitive stimulation therapy. I'll just put a bit of information about that. Um, when it was first evaluated, and a good summary in a Cochrane review in 2012, when first evaluated, it looks certainly effective and cost effective when delivered over this relatively short time period, seven weeks. It's the people with mild to moderate, it's at the early stages of dementia. And then a recent paper that Martin Oral, first authors in the British Health Psychiatry, shows that if you continue to deliver this therapy, now slightly less intensively, if you continue with it, it continues to improve quality of life. And in combination, ACHIs are the common esterase inhibitors, the medications, the most common one being genefazil, that uh, when you combine this um, therapy with that, you get added benefit. The, the, the impact is bigger than the sum of the parts uh, than the CST and the medication. And it looks cost effective, and Francesco D'Amico, colleague here, um, has led that economic evaluation. So there's another area where we're getting some good findings. Now, more generally, I put other treatments, it's kind of a broad term, I couldn't think of anything more precise. This is a, a cover of the NICE review. If you don't visit the NICE website every day, then you must be sad. I don't know what's wrong with you. <laughs> but um, this, the NICE website is brilliant for evidence uh, sources. This guideline of 2007, I think it's been updated, but I haven't seen an update. I uh, may have missed it. Um, they give you lots of good evidence. Let me just mention a couple of studies. Two here. One is a study led by Shubhi Banerjee which looked at people with dementia and comorbid depression, and it compared two antidepressants with placebo, so three on the trial. It found that sertraline and metazapine and placebo, which put that in there, were equally effective, no difference at all. Now, when Renee Romeo, a colleague at the Institute of Psychiatry, looked, did, she did the cost-effectiveness evaluation, she found that metazapine was actually more cost-effective than sertraline or placebo. And the reason was that metazapine has a sedative effect instead of a good measure sedative. Now, we can discuss the ethics of this for quite a long time. <laughs> but okay, what we've got is an interesting uh, result there, something which seems to be beneficial for carers, makes no difference to the person with dementia. And then a piece of work that Amy Spector, UCL led, on comorbid dementia and anxiety shows that CBT is effective and cost effective in a pilot study that looks quite important. Now the area that hasn't been evaluated very much is comorbid dementia with physical health problems. And I'll just put here one statistic, that's all, which is in England, if you have dementia and you're a fractured hip, you used to bones, as you're about five years old now, you would have 43 days in the inpatient bed. If you have fractured hip but no dementia, the length of stay will be just 26. So we know that dementia complicates the admission and care process for a range of different conditions. Okay, and that's just one example. We still don't have very good evidence 
in that particular area about how we respond. Let me go on to home-based care. Um, I've got here surprising little evidence on what works. Of course, there is some. Um, uh, David Chalice, uh, visitor in Manchester, he did a big study looking at uh, patterns of home support. We'll publish uh, that report next year. Uh, and there's been a lot of attention in England on reablement home care, not specifically looking at people with dementia, but the evaluation that Caroline Van Denning at York led um, with Karen Jones and others um, that, that suggested it wasn't robust sub evaluation but suggested that people with dementia, there were some successes. Okay, so there's some hints of success. So where is the future then? Is the future robots, okay? Um, I was surprised, if you put Google, if you Google dementia robots, there's a surprisingly large number of pictures. Many of them are rather twee pictures of a robot dog or robot cat, um, which nevertheless, the evidence suggests people do like, they are beneficial, okay? So I'm not in any way skeptical. I think the future is definitely in this zone and in Japan and lots and lots of work going on now to develop that and those recent um, findings coming out later in the year. But at the moment I would say I'm a little bit hesitant. Um, this telecare evaluation is a big study, the WSD study, all system demonstrators, um, which we were part of. Kate Henderson, colleague here at the PSSIU, led the kind of evaluation, her degree and I were working with her. Uh, and what we found in that is that telecare compared to usual care, there might be some small benefits. Cost per colleague, nearly £300,000. Go away. Okay? It's not going to get supported by us. So, at the moment, telecare, this is not for people with dementia specifically, but telecare doesn't look like it is the solution. But maybe it's because the techniques we have at the moment are a bit clunky, a bit unresponsive to individual circumstances. On case management, I'm not going to show you any evidence at all. Okay? What I am going to say is a very nice uh, Cochrane review led by Siobhan Riley, involving lots of people. Uh, I've seen it, Siobhan shared it, we were doing some work a couple of months ago. It's not out yet, so I can't really tell you the findings. They're mixed, that's what I'm going to say. But it's, there is now quite a bit of evidence, and they pulled it together really usefully. So I don't know when it's coming out, but it should be very soon. And then the final area. Um, is attitudes and awareness. I put up here the Dementia Friends symbol. Um, many of you will have seen this. Dementia Friends is an initiative started in Japan. We've borrowed it and we love it here. The idea, policy aims are to build dementia friendly communities, uh, to raise public awareness. Uh, achievements so far, firstly, a huge growth in the number of individuals trained in dementia awareness. That's happening very successfully. Um, being done in schools and shops and banks and transport organisations and allegedly being done in Parliament uh, in the autumn, although not many MPs have so far done it. Uh, have attitudes changed? Not very much. Okay, so far. There are some improvements, but they're pretty modest. So, some way to go at the moment. Uh, there is uh, work to be done with that area to change attitudes and awareness of dementia. Okay, so I want to very quickly look at some new scenarios and show you a hypothetical result, but also a sort of cautionary result about what happens with the ones I've shown you <coughs> so far. Okay? And this is going to be, um, we're going to look at a piece of work that uh, a number of us did for the Department of Health in a very short space of time with um, no stress whatsoever, um, uh, which we reported in June. And what we were asked to do was to look at current care for people to measure and then look at four other scenarios. So what would happen if nobody got diagnosed with dementia? What would happen if people get diagnosed but get no post-diagnostic support? Then what would happen if we had those evidence-based interventions of the kind I've shown you already available for the whole population? of life to some extent, but mainly look at the cost implications. I'm just going to show you um, a couple of results from that. So firstly, this column, these columns show you, the yellow is unpaid care, the blue is social care, the green is health care. And this one on the left is current, current care arrangement, basically. It's not quite accurate, we've done some new estimates, uh, 
at the time we published it, was about uh, 640. Um, this is denepacil, that medication I mentioned. If everybody with Alzheimer's was given denepacil, what would happen? If everybody in mild to moderate got cognitive stimulation, what would happen? If everybody with dementia had support through case management, what would happen? And then if there was a carer support of the scarped kind, what would happen? And so we traced out the cost consequences. And you can see, it's not a very interesting slide. Okay? There isn't very much difference between those columns, which suggests that if you do roll out these interventions to the whole population, it doesn't make a lot of difference to the overall cost of dementia. Now, this is a very crude study, and it was carried out with a lot of stress, in case anybody wasn't going to pick up on that English irony. Um, but you know, there were limitations. And in particular, we weren't able to look at this it's a macro simulation model looking at cell-based changes. We didn't look at changes within the cells or distribution impacts and so on. Now, Raphael is going to be presenting the method and more detailed results later on in the conference. So I'll leave the more detailed stuff for him. I will just show you the other scenarios we looked at, the disease-modifying treatment. So now you've got current support here. Then we've got one which is where the progression of dementia is slowed down, and people, people still die at the same rate. Progression is slowed down, but life expectancy increases. Progression is slowed down, uh, life expectancy increases, and there are some reduced costs. You then manage to delay the onset by a year, or you delay the onset by three years. And you can see now that with the disease-modifying treatment, this slide begins to get a bit more interesting. Okay, the costs now are looking like they could come down with these treatments, which do not exist at the moment. Okay, so this is a very good example of how economists can make a beautiful slide out of pure hypothesis. Okay. <laughs> okay, so um, they don't exist at the moment. However, what we haven't included in those costs is, well, sorry, let me first of all say, in that highest cost column, it's also the highest quality of life, so there is a payoff uh, for the high cost. But what about the treatment cost? We haven't included the cost of medication. We've assumed that some very generous pharmaceutical company is going to give these drugs for free, okay, which I don't think is likely to happen. Okay. We've, we've put in an assumption that it costs £1,000 per person per year. That's the dark. Gray. The light grey means that it costs ten thousand pounds per person per year. Okay, and you can suddenly see that compared to current care, these don't look quite so economically attractive. Ten thousand pounds is a third of the cost of some of the drugs uh, for some neurological conditions. Okay, new drugs. So there has to be a big change. Something has to change in order to make something disease modifying affordable. But you know, I think that's where we have to be going. So, let me then go on and finally, just very quickly, two slides on new directions and then the final slide <coughs> to conclude. So on new directions, Jose Luis mentioned um, the World Dementia Council, which was set up by what was the G8 uh, in December and then very quickly became G7, uh, for reasons we all know. <laughs> um, uh, but the G7 countries set up the World Dementia Council to do a number of things. And I'm going to show you two slides with the priorities that they have. Um, one is to try and inject new money into the area to get drive investment. Part of the difficulty in this area for pharmaceutical companies is that it is a very difficult area to develop new treatments. There's lots of heterogeneity within the population. Trials need to be huge, need to run for quite a long time. You need to start very early in the course of the illness if they're going to have an impact and lots of other things, which have meant that many pharmaceutical companies have come into the area and very quickly moved out again. So one aim is to try and make it easier for companies and others and university labs and so on to invest in the area, to, to invest time in the area. Second objective is research collaboration, to develop incentives for new partnerships across the different parts of the sector. The third one is to improve regulation, try and speed up the regulatory pathway, make it easier to do research studies, not take quite so long to get studies conducted and set up and so on. And the other three objectives, the other three priorities, sharing knowledge, sharing databases, trying to pool in what we know,
works in health and social care and disseminating that information, sharing that information as quickly as possible and raising awareness about the consequences and challenges of dementia in order to change and help to change priorities. Okay, so that's what the World Dementia Council is doing. Um, and then finally, my final slide then. So I said the future should be two-pronged. Okay. Uh, dementia has become a major worldwide focus for long-term <laughs> care, for health care. It has many associated challenges. I showed you a few of those. Uh, there is new evidence emerging from studies, lots and lots of research. Go back to those 40, what it was, 45 papers in 1974, the world outside of that key word. Most of the new studies that have come along since then will be kind of carried out by biologists and chemists and some clinicians. But there's a growing number now which are looking at care arrangements, and so we are beginning to get better evidence. However, and I've just put up there doubts about the long term affordability of the currently known interventions. Okay? If we are going to roll out these interventions more widely, they're going to save a lot of money, which is not necessarily a bad thing, but we have to find a way of affording them. And so I think the search has to be for both better <coughs> care, but also hopefully for better treatments, more disease modifying. And so hence, I think the future needs to be two pronged finding a cure if we can, or at least finding better medical and other treatments and certainly putting lots of emphasis on better care. And that's it. Thank you. And, uh, and we've got um, three minutes, four minutes for questions. So could you please say who you are when you ask the question? Uh, so this is both the University of Melbourne. Thank you, Martin, uh, for a wonderful overview and it's good to see the mention of worldwide. I've been recently in India 263 million people are going to be over at the age of 60 by 2050 in India. I was recently at a conference in Kobe City in Japan with WHO where they were looking for frugal interventions when you show the figures for um, <coughs> developing countries. What does your worldwide network, and if you were President Modi in India, what sort of interventions would you be suggesting because there's this enormous middle class population that has all the chronic conditions that um, we have in the West, and then there's this um, very proud rural um, population. But the predicted, uh, projected uh, numbers of dementia are going to be very significant. So, if you were looking at a frugal innovation in a developing country for dementia, what would you recommend? Well, if you look at that list, and there's not necessarily so absolutely. <coughs> think of. But you know, I think we have to think about the prevention end of things and what we can do to stop many of these. Uh, I mean, we can't do a huge amount, but there are things, as suggested by Carol Brain's team, that we could prevent. So it's partly about that. We know that heart health is good for brain health. We know that Western heart arm health has been exported across the world. So we need to be aware of that impact that we have. I think then it's working with communities and with carers and helping the family carers to continue to provide the role, so supporting them. So I think it's finding those low cost, low uh, investment, low tech uh, interventions which can help people and support them to provide care in ordinary community settings. When we start to get into treatments that involve you know, powers of, of the psychologists or medications, then we're into quite different difficult territory. Uh, Josh Wiener, RTI International, uh, Washington, D.C. So um, you could have given your talk by taking the word out of England and putting the word United States in there. It's an invitation. That's <laughs> exactly the same. Um, <clears throat> so, but you didn't, didn't reference any U.S. studies, even though we have lots of those as well. So I guess one question is, uh, what could be done to do more inter, uh, international learning. And the other thing is that in the US, the political response to all of this is just to pour more money into basic research um, rather than to try to do much on the care system side. Has that been a uh, a development here as well? Yeah, I mean, certainly, the, well, there's certainly been a lot more money poured into basic research for sure. So that has been, I think that gets to the highest profile. But 
the research funders here in the UK have put a lot of fun extra funding into care research, um, so they have recognised that. The World Dementia Council started off with a focus almost exclusively on that basic research in that clinic, more clinical end, but recognises that, that even if we find a cure today in a laboratory somewhere, okay, it's going to take many years before it ever rolls out to be available to people. So we have to put attention, pay more attention to prevention and to cure and to care, prevention and care now, because if there is a cure out there, it'll be a long time before it's available. Okay, I agree with you. I think, again, there's a lot, I mean, what I didn't say, particularly in relation to the care and support intervention, start intervention, that that Jill and colleagues who developed that, developed it from a very good US model, wants to see what well, they change various aspects of it, it works beautifully well in our context, I think. So I think that learning is very, very important. One last question. David Fukushitz, Vienna University of Economics. Um, you started your talk um, and mentioned that you left your mobile phone on, your smartphone on, because you expect a call, you expect a message. So for us, <laughs> it is very important. <laughs> it is very those technologies are very important, and we got used to it. And carers of people who suffer from dementia are also becoming more used to such technologies. And then we learned that telecare is not cost effective at the moment. So what would you reckon is the role of assistive technologies in the future? What needs to be done that they get more cost effective, that they get more effective and more cost effective? Yeah, okay, well two th quick things. One is, I've got a colleague of mine here, Jackie DeMant, who's doing a PhD on e-inclusion for older people. Um, she's about uh, 27 days from submitting her thesis, I think, very close. Um, and so she's been looking at how older people feel about assistive technology, and there's very mixed views, but of course new cohorts coming through, people like me anyway, as, as I get into that cohort, will be more prepared for the assistive technology, so that will make it a bit easier. Secondly, I think there are some studies, and we were involved, Jackie and I, and others were involved in a study called Monami, um, which is a European study. It was the most, most inappropriately named study. <laughs> 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 it's a funny nightmare, but there we go. Um, but, um, but in the evaluation, um, what we found was that when you give people, you know, older people or disabled people, uh, these assistive technologies, very simple adaptations to mobile phones can make quite a big difference in terms of communication with distant relatives and so on. So I think, yeah, definitely, I think that the future is there. Um, I think we just have to make sure that we remember that the people with dementia, people with dementia will have a particular set of needs. Their carers will have a particular set of needs and constraints and need to make sure that, that technology is available and ready for them as well as for the wider population. We've run out of time, so uh, all these left, please do thank you, Martin, for an excellent presentation.